Welcome to day one of the Meridian Technical Track. It's a big week, we've got a lot to cover, and by the end of it, I promise we're all gonna be a lot smarter, a lot smarter. We're gonna hear from every SDF engineering team and from experts throughout the ecosystem, and we'll get everything from a high-level view of anchors to a detailed description of the low-level assembly language used for Stellar transactions. There have been a lot of exciting technical developments in 2020, and there are many more on the way, and if you stick with me, you'll get to hear all about them. Stellar has always been developer focused, but now more than ever, it's easy to roll up your sleeves and start building solutions to real world challenges. So today, we're going to focus on the network itself. We'll get some insight into protocol development, into how to build apps that take advantage of new protocol features, and into Horizon, the Stellar API. But first, let's talk about nodes. Fundamentally, Stellar is a peer-to-peer -peer network made up of nodes, which are computers that keep a common ledger and that communicate to validate and add transactions to it. We're gonna kick things off with a conversation about those nodes, about what they do, about what it takes to run one, and about how together they create and support a decentralized network. We've got some serious experts on the line. Um, these are people with real ops chops, and we are very lucky to have them with us today. Konstantin Richter, CEO of Blockteamen, a company that offers nodes as a, as a service. Torsten Stuber, CTO of Satoshi Pay, one of Stellar's earliest adopters and most trusted validators. And leading the conversation, Marta Lakova, a software engineer on the Stellar core team at the SDF. Marta, take it away. Awesome. Well, hello, everybody. It's good to be here. Uh, my name is Marta Lakova. Um, I'm a software engineer on the Stellar core team at Stellar Development Foundation. Uh, like Justin was saying, today we have a panel on decentralization and the Stellar network. Uh, we have two awesome speakers, uh, Konstantin Richter, uh, the CEO of Blockdaemon. Uh, Blockdaemon provides infrastructure as a service that allows users to deploy validators on different blockchains, including the Stellar Network, in just a few clicks. We also have Torsten Stuber, uh, CTO of Satoshi Pay. Satoshi Pay has been focused on transforming online publishing as it aims to eliminate the need for ads and paywalls by allowing the consumers to micropay for online content. Uh, well, thank you guys so much for being here. Uh, super excited to have you. I'd like to jump straight into it and start by unpacking the meaning of the term decentralization. So I think we all can agree that it's quite a buzzword and is definitely a very abstract term. But what does it really mean? Uh, in the context of Stellar, nodes get to run the Stellar consensus protocol and um, nodes also um, get to make decentralized decisions around who they want to trust when it comes to transaction confirmation and transaction valid, uh, validation. This is done via something that we call quorum sets. And quorum set is essentially a group of nodes uh, on the network that you as an individual or a, an organization trust. So a consensus protocol is one layer of decentralization. But what are some of the other layers that people maybe don't tend to think about? Um, Constantine, maybe we can start with you. Yes, sorry, I had to unmute myself. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, and uh, hi, Mata. Yeah, great question. I mean, decentralization is, um, uh, you know, a nice philosophical term often used to uh, uh, belittle uh, of the competing uh, blockchains uh, in any other e ecosystem. A a any blockchain has its own sort of definition of what it means. I think the key thing to understand around decentralization is, I think of it like a golf handicap. It, it really depends on the respective structure of the network. So um, the metrics that should judge decentralization look different based on the life cycle and the mechanics of a network, right? And so first and foremost, the purpose of decentralization is to avoid a single point of failures or uh, you know, an easy way for uh, a non-majority of a network to um, uh, steal the network. And so, uh, and, and so, so, so that's number one. Um, I think when it comes to, um, and so the basic thing that people always talk about decentralization is how many nodes and where do these nodes sit, right? So it, it's just like, hey, is there, uh, are they all on Amazon, on Google, or are they all in Northern America, are some in Europe? So some of it is network architecture and performance to manage latency, as well as failovers. Um, but that's just really one dimension. And I would say that the, um, uh, because the decentralization across a node disbursement impacts the functionality of the network a lot. Um, it really depends on the current purpose of the network, how many different nodes you need across how many different data centers. We can all agree that the basic um, 
difference is you don't want all nodes in one data center in one territory. Um, but I think um, one important component to remember is that there's a lot of other factors coming into decentralization when it comes to being a single point of failure. Some of them might relate to the software tools we use. When we talk about Docker images being used to deploy nodes, um, there are certain software um, um, you know, open source systems that might create vulnerabilities in uh, bringing certain nodes down. We had a great incident happen last week on Ethereum um, when the guest client had some problems there, which was really down to, you know, ultimately a software update that was uh, processed. And so, you know, you can see there's so many different, uh, uh, so much different variety. I think one of the things I would like to point out is that um, the more mature an organization uh, like actually the Stella Foundation, the more advanced they get in managing decentralization. I think often it gets a little misunderstood when there's like, hey, maybe there's 30 tier one validators out there that are managing the bulk of the network. Um, but again, you try to avoid single points of failure. So you can have actually a good decentralized network with three nodes. Um, and right. so that's, uh, you know, let, maybe I, I pause here and, and see where, where else we go. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I think infrastructure and tools is definitely something that we should keep in mind as we are, you know, adding more, more nodes onto the network. And um, regarding like location and infrastructure, um, organizations in the network today um, are actually strongly encouraged to have this redundancy when it comes to running their validators and also make sure that they are geographically spreading out their um, validators. And um, for some nodes, uh, specifically for tier one, uh, like you were mentioning, it's actually required. Um, so tier one is basically a set of organizations on the network that hold themselves to a um, higher standard in terms of uptime and responsiveness. Uh, these nodes also publish a full history archive to help with network resiliency. Um, and these organizations also run at least three validators that are spread out um, all across the globe. So there are nodes in the US, UK, uh, Germany, Finland, Hong Kong, and I might have missed some of the locations that, you know, Blogzium and Satoshi Pay have their <laughs> validators in, but the point is that they're, they are spread out. Um, and so today we have uh, uh, seven organizations in tier one. Um, it is uh, 23 validating nodes and around 120 validating nodes total on the network. Um, so since you guys are no strangers to tier one, as both Satoshi Pay and Blob Demon are in tier one, um, I'm just curious to hear about your experience of becoming um, a tier one uh, organization and also how does uh, your business uh, utilize the Stellar Network? Um, so maybe I can talk about this. Um, of course, um, we are basically, uh, we have been using Stellar for a long time. We were one of the first early adopters have been using this for over three years now. And in particular to, to maybe some other companies, we also use it as our main decentralized ledger for our product. So we already recognize that for payments, Stellar is that decentralized ledger to use. And we said that this is the one we want to use nodes for. And that's why we deployed our first nodes over three years ago. Uh, at that time, there were not so many nodes in the Stellar network. But uh, since we deployed our nodes, we also learned a lot as early adopters. And we did a lot for the ecosystem for other uh, maintainers to be able to deploy their own nodes. There were a lot of questions uh, about what needs to be done. Um, I mean, it's maybe not super straightforward to deploy a node. There has been a lot, a lot has been done, but we tried to provide a very simple means for other people to deploy nodes as well. And uh, of course, the more you do for a network and the more you do for a, an ecosystem, uh, the more important you get. And I think that uh, was one of the, that was one of the main factors that made us a tier, made our nodes tier one nodes. So we are very thankful for the support. And uh, in addition to this, we also did some more research, uh, what it means to provide the tier one infrastructure. But maybe we can talk more about this later. Um, um, Sure. Uh, Constantine, you got anything to add? Yeah, similar. I mean, we're obviously, we're not running an app per se. We, we you know, run infrastructure. And so our goal with Stella uh, was to make it very easy for anyone to ultimately run a validator. And so our customers are custodians, exchanges, uh, payment companies, anyone who wants professional grade infrastructure. And so for us, the journey becoming a tier one validator was so amazing um, was that we, 
um, got a lot of access to great guys like Justin who gave the intro. Um, and we are continuously evolving functionality of our tier one setup that then trickles down into our general product offering. And so what's been really valuable for us is, and then that general product offering, let's say is used by dozens and dozens of institutions to uh, support or trade um, on the Stellar network. And so we have a really interesting feedback loop and the ability to um, uh, you know, enhance functionality of the product. So one thing we've learned as a tier one validator, specifically around quorum sets, um, you know, a lot of the learnings went into automation tooling that we now make accessible on our platform. So if you launch a Stellar node on the Blockdema platform, you know, we automatically adjust quorum sets for you. There's a bunch of different configurations that automate a lot of this stuff. But I would say that um, also, you know, working with a lot of different protocols, uh, one of the things that we've really enjoyed and are continuing to enjoy is that we have access to a very smart um, validator network and can continuously improve uh, the stability of the network. So I think the Stella Foundation does a very good job in uh, reaching out to us. And, you know, every quarter we talk about like, you know, what have we learned? What are the new sort of fixes and things we should implement on the overall infrastructure? So I think it's just a very healthy uh, process. Well, you know, it was definitely a complex journey. Um, and, uh, uh, but, you know, it's super rewarding. I would say our automotive Stella tool, probably the most advanced protocol management tool we have for all protocols, uh, just because, um, you know, Stella does run a process for a long time. You know, it's a, there's something to be said. Uh, there's a lot of hype around new projects launching, specifically in the POS world. And it's easy to forget that, uh, you know, there's some amazing existing ones. Um, that are just continuously improving over time. Yeah, and I mean, like, you know, we view that as kind of a, a land of exciting opportunity. Like, we are happy in the place where we are today, but the, we think that, you know, there's also kind of a lot of really exciting things that we could be doing. And that's why it is so valuable to get feedback, you know, from you guys, right? Because then we can uh, really kind of understand what the network needs and, you know, uh, build, build tools for that. Um, but I want to get back uh, to talk about the, um, so Torsten, I think you mentioned that running the nodes can be pretty tricky, and I, I definitely agree with you on that front. Um, so I think in the world of Stellar, the additional complexity is added um, when the nodes have to select their quorum sets. And so selecting a quorum set is kind of like this non-trivial thing, uh, because you actually have to make sure that your quorum overlaps with other quorums on the network. So this overlap is called um, quorum intersection and uh, quorum intersection is essential for the network safety. So in order for the network to agree on the exact same value, there has to be this quorum intersection. But the problem is that uh, uh, configuring it is actually pretty tricky. Um, it gets complicated very fast. And we actually realized that there's a lot of, a big part of the community out there doesn't actually fully understand it. So I guess my question is, um, I think, uh, Constantine, you mentioned that, you know, you guys are building tools to make it easier for people to configure their quorum sets. Um, what are the things that we should be doing to kind of educate the community better and, you know, making sure that um, these concepts that are unique to Stellar are clear and intuitive to uh, people who can potentially join the network? Yeah, I mean, so, so, you know, and it, I, you have to interrupt me because I don't it, like when I get too salesy. But what's been interesting for us, for example, on the quorum sets is so initially when we launched our product, we pre configured hard coded quorum sets that just worked, right? So, um, so there wasn't a choice. We just made sure that we uh, on the back end automatically added folks, um, you know, like the Satoshi phase that we knew would have uh, decent performance. Now uh, we've evolved the product where we actually give you a choice where you can select every high performant um, other validator for a particular quorum set. So now we've stepped out of being selecting five and giving you the options of whatever the, the uh, you know, all the tier one validators that are running a quality service and you can pick and choose. I think obviously developer education and also governance education over time is something that needs to happen more and more um, of. I think one of the big challenges and, and things we think about a lot is when it comes to node operation as incentive models for people to participate more in the network. And I think it's Stella, uh, for the Stella network, we had an interesting inflection point in there. So I think the network now is very stable. 
Um, I think we've got made good progress in tooling. We have a good solid subset of validators that are professional. Um, and so now I think from my perspective, what I would love to see in the network is more people running nodes. And the only and, and then the question is, how do we make that happen? Um, I feel like the pain points, a lot of them we uh, are able to address because we could, like at least from, from our perspective, we can run perfect Stellar nodes for anyone with a click of a button, right? And so that's not a, um, a limiting factor anymore. The question is, who should do so? And how are they going to make commercial sense of it? Because there is a cost tied to running these nodes. Um, so that, that will be sort of my, my input. Uh, Torsten, any, any take yeah, on that? I think, I think what Constancy said is uh, very interesting um, to pick up on this. Um, one particular important aspect is the, is the uh, incentive structure that you have to provide for users to, to deploy their own nodes, to deploy their own validator nodes. I mean, for, for Bitcoin, this is very clear. You deploy a node, you can mine node, you can mine blocks, you get money. For Stellar, it's not like this. There is no mining. And uh, what you do is you participate in the fees that are paid for every transaction. But this is by far not, or currently, that's by far not enough uh, to actually maintain your own node. And what I think, or what we observe, is that uh, currently the, the, the main incentive to run your own node is that you're a company and you have a product that's somehow based on Stellar and, and uses Stellar and their, their main product. And of course, if you do this, you have a very big interesting, a very big interest in maintaining the standard network and keeping it stable, and keeping it uh, reliable. And uh, that, of course, is an incentive enough to deploy your own nodes. Um, and I think in the future, you also want to incentivize users that don't have a product that runs on Stellar to also take part in maintaining uh, the Stellar network. And uh, so the incentive structure is something that um, I think needs to change or there needs to be some more progress around that. Um, another thing that's, that might be interesting for people that deploy their nodes is to understand how to set up their Chrome sets and how, what to do in order to become a tier one node as well. So for the, for the Chrome sets themselves, you already mentioned that this is a very complicated process. It can be simple, but in general, it's really complex. Um, I already mentioned that we did some research in the past. And uh, one thing that we, and also other researchers found uh, is that the right setup for your Chrome sets is an NP complete problem. And if you're a computer scientist, you might have heard of, uh, about NP completeness, but what it means is that it's basically very complex. So when you have 20 nodes or 30 nodes, it's still easy to understand, but once the network grows, it becomes infeasible. Um, and I think what's the, what the right way uh, forward is, is to provide some simple tools or some simple, um, some simple rules that allow you to set up your nodes and your Chrome sets in a way that uh, you will always uh, have safety and liveness, the main two factors that you want to have in every network. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, maybe for the tier one, uh, how to become a tier one node, I actually think that the uh, or maybe we should actually elaborate what, uh, on what a tier one node is. A tier one node is not just a node that is very famous and used by many other nodes, but there's actually a very precise mathematical definition about what a tier one node is. So at least you can provide such a definition in Stellar Network. And currently, as you already said, there are basically seven companies that, that provide tier one nodes. And uh, the tier one node structure, the substructure, actually has strictly more power than all the other nodes. And uh, in order to have a more decentralized system in the future, I think more companies and more uh, users need to be able to join the tier one structure. Um, and for that reason, I think there should be a clear plan about how to develop the tier one system, how to make it possible for other users or other companies to, to join that system and to deploy their own tier one nodes or to be integrated in that structure. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, it is also interesting to kind of see the progression of, you know, where we were like a couple of years ago and how we progressed into this tier one structure. So back then, uh, actually, the network was configured in such a way that um, a lot of nodes dependent on, dependent on uh, SDFs nodes. So a lot of nodes on the network had SDF in, uh, in their quorum sets, which is not a great property because it makes SDF essentially a single point of failure. And so since then, like we've 
progressed into this, uh, you know, tier one structure, which is, um, you know, uh, we feel like we're in a much better place uh, because SDF could turn off their validators and the network would still be able to proceed and, you know, finish a consensus round and close ledgers and just keep and just keep going, which I think is um, a, a step in the right direction. But I'm not necessarily saying that, you know, this is how it should be. Like, I think it's interesting to think about potential topologies that as more um, as more organizations and individuals join the network, I think it's really interesting to see how the topology may evolve. Like we might be just growing tier one, um, but it might not necessarily be like a permanent topology. So I think that's um, it, it kind of interesting to see, you know, where where this takes us. Um, but uh, I just kind of want to talk a little bit more about actually joining uh, tier one. I know uh, Torsten, you mentioned a little bit about it that you know there are very specific there are very specific definitions of, of a tier one node. Um, can we maybe just briefly go over you know kind of the requirements and um, how exactly does the process work if one uh, wants to join tier one? Um, um, so to my knowledge, there is no defined process to become tier one node. I think it's more like a, a social process. Um, first, tier one currently means that other nodes have to uh, respect you and trust you and say that you might be a good comp a contributor and a trustful contributor to the Stellar network. And uh, once other nodes decide to integrate you in your, in your Chrome set and particularly other tier one nodes, you automatically become a tier one node as well. So it's, it's a decision of the other tier one nodes whether they want to integrate you. And for that reason, of course, you have to, uh, I guess that uh, the best way uh, to become a tier one node um, is to provide valuable um, support to the Stellar system, maybe deploy your own nodes help other people make open source software possible um, develop or, int or or take part in furthering um, stellar extension protocols whatever talk to a lot of people um, all these things or maybe have a very important and uh, very interesting product that uses stellar utilizes stellar mainly um, I think that's mainly it at the moment, but maybe in the future there could be uh, some defined process for this, some some steps that you have to go through uh, in order to get uh, become a tier one validator. One way we could, for example, uh, like there's one way we can fast track it because we can add people to the quorum sets that other people use, um, uh, which we currently do, and so. Um, so, for example, if a company is particularly interested, um, so we have a uh, on our respective backend, we currently list, uh, uh, you know, kind of we have uh, all the current uh, tier one um, validators are able to be automatically selected for quorum sets, but that's it. And mm -hmm. so we're, uh, you know, so but we can add people to that list, right? And so, but for that to be added to the list, we would have to define, you know, we would have to make sure that this is. A node that you know obviously fulfills the requirements in terms of uh, functionality and uptime, um, and so I think uh, there's ways to do it. But I think the key question really is um, ultimately um, the uh, uh, there isn't necessarily an incentive for anyone to be a tier one participant uh, because you can have an app running and run a full validator um, that's not a tier one node. So um, there's currently no financial incentive to be a tier one operator, you'll have a lot of overhead and you'll need to, uh, you know, run a really good node, which means you need to have an expert on it um, pretty much all the time. And so I think that's one of the interesting questions to see also at what point do we want to extend the tier one network? Um, and, uh, you know, because it creates also a little more complexity. So it should be difficult because you want people who know what they're doing um, to be a tier one validator. So you don't want to uh, but at the same point, you know, we do need to think about um, how to currently set it up because the cost of running um, the tier one setup is, you know, not non-substantial. So right. I think that'll be interesting. And that's interesting too, because a lot of the folks you want to run nodes uh, who are experts in node running are used to commercialize them via POS networks, for example. And so, um, you know, but the Stellar Foundation has been good with grants and other means to kind of solidify that. And there's actually a lot of um, discussions and thoughts, I think, in, in the general industry uh, on how we can incentivize people um, to run more nodes over time. 
as well as aiding um, uh, you know, the XLL tokens with uh, liquidity and getting more people to uh, partake in it. What's great for folks like us, um, and when I mean liquidity, sometimes sounds mean, but you know, we, uh, we, uh, we get paid partly in, in, in lumens and then we also liquidate lumens because we have to pay overhead for it. But ultimately that puts liquidity into the network as well. You know? And so it's an interesting way of um, building econo you know, economical incentive models here have a real impact. Yeah, 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 definitely. And I mean, uh, like basically growing, growing the network and attracting uh, validators onto the network and actually figuring out these uh, incentives is definitely something that is on our minds, you know, uh, thinking about the strategy of like 2021, but also like a longer term strategy. So uh, it's definitely very interesting. And like I was saying, you know, we view that as kind of a, an exciting lens of opportunity and kind of, you know, see where that goes and things that, you know, with the new things that we build. Um, so we are running a little bit lower on time and I did want to have some time so, uh, for questions. So let's see what we got. Um, have you had any issues regarding liability being a tier one node? Um, any regulator, regulatory issues from any countries? I mean, from our perspective, what? no. Uh, we are in the process of getting a money transmitter license set up. So, so far, so good. And we hope to be prepared if that occurs. I think Torsten was alluding to something which is transaction fees. Uh, they're currently neg negligible on the network. And so I think regulators from that perspective uh, will not touch node operators just because, you know, for the three bucks a month, um, uh, you know, kind of it's probably not worth it. When that becomes more relevant, um, regulation and uh, the question around do you have to be a money transmitter in order to run nodes will become more pertinent. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, well, another question we have is um, when validators are spun up via block daemon, doesn't it create more centralization? Yeah, I mean, so again, it goes back to the definition of decentralization. So what we, the way we currently uh, run all deployments is that uh, you can pick between a hundred different data centers that are all pre-configured on Amazon, Google, et cetera, et cetera. And then the way we run our own security uh, as a sort of enterprise company is that we have very clear uh, legal frameworks to protect the network uh, from it. Also, when we run uh, nodes and VMs on individual clouds, uh, we have clearly defined um, access points, right? Which means ultimately um, there's one engineer who has access to one VM uh, on one network. And so, uh, the, the current uh, degree of decentralization that's more interesting to Stella is more territorial dispersion of nodes to increase, um, have better latency on the network. And so uh, you really have to look at what is the current issue with decentralization. And so, but for us, um, you know, I would say, uh, again, where you don't want us to be the only node operator in the network, um, but we also have the ability to provide a lot of, you know, we have failover systems, disaster recovery systems, a lot of the stuff that gets the network uh, back up on its feet if something ever were to happen, right? And so it's a, it's a game of balance. Um, but on the first degree of decentralization, we're decentralizing the network by making sure that, for example, we measure decentralization of a network based on the number of nodes, territories, and uh, uh, cloud providers they're on. So if we see, hey, there's an over-dependence on Amazon, let's move more nodes to Google or Azure and so we do those type of things. So I'd say it's a, um, you know, it goes either way. Yeah, um, absolutely. And um, we also had a question on, so there was uh, basically no f formal process for joining tier one, but um, what is it, what, what actually happens when, um, you know, let's say an organization uh, is ready and uh, basically, what what does it do? Um, and I think uh, I, I can speak a little bit about, about that. Um, basically, uh, um, the organization that meets all the technical requirements uh, just needs to contact the tier one nodes and basically showcase that it has met all of those requirements. And so if, if so, then there is a little bit of discussion going on within tier one. Um, and then you know they update they update the quorum sets um but this process is very informal and i think as we're growing this has been working well for for us but you know as we're growing um we will look into formalizing these um processes a bit more um 
All right. So it looks like we are uh, short on time, but um, it was really awesome to talk to you guys. Um, thank you, everybody, for watching and enjoy the rest of the conference.